All right, so the goal of this video is to, um, well, we are going to determine the area under our function between A and B, and we are going to determine it without error. So the goal of this video is to develop a way to not just estimate the area under the curve, but to estimate it without error. So really to determine what that area is. And um, well, the, the strategy for that is going to be, we're going to use an estimate. We're going to use an estimate with n rectangles here, where n is going to be a generic n. And then we're gonna let n go to infinity, because this is under the premise of what we talked about today uh, in class, actually, or I guess yesterday, depending on when you're watching this video, but uh, it was discussed in class last time that the, the more rectangles you have in your computation, the more your rectangles capture the undulation of the function, the better your estimate is. So in theory, number of rectangles goes to infinity, the error on your area computation will go to zero. Now, in order to pull this off, we're going to need to take one assumption, and this is a key assumption, but we are going to assume that f has an antiderivative function. So we are going to assume that uh, you could take uh, the integral of f and you're gonna get out some capital F function that is the antiderivative function of little f. So our little f function here, we're assuming is a function that we can take the antiderivative of, which we know is a giant collection of functions. Uh, because frankly, uh, almost every function we've encountered in this class is a function that you could compute the derivative of or compute the antiderivative of. So let's start by assuming that we have an antiderivative function. Uh, and well, uh, before I proceed directly with the act of going through this problem, I want us to access a fact, which is in fact the mean value theorem from last test. But I want to state the mean value theorem in terms of capital F here. Because you see, uh, whereas the standard mean value theorem was in terms of little f and f prime, uh, f prime being the derivative, uh, here I want to state this in terms of capital F. So assume you have a capital F function that is continuous and differentiable on the intervals of interest. Well then, there's going to be some c between a and b such that the derivative of f at c, this is what used to play the role of f prime, but now it's going to be little f because little f is the derivative of capital F. Uh, uh, the derivative at c is going to be equal to the change in the y over the change in the x, the slope through the endpoints. So that would be capital F of b minus capital F of a over b minus a. So this is the mean value theorem uh, in terms of uh, a, a, a large f instead of a standard f. So where we had f prime, we've got a little f, so be it. Uh, it's the same content. And my claim is that this mean value theorem is going to apply to our function. Since we have an antiderivative function, let's call it capital F, then capital F is differentiable everywhere. It's not just differentiable on AB, it's differentiable across its entire domain by virtue of the fact that you have an antiderivative, you certainly then have a derivative. So, and the, the differentiability actually takes care of the continuity because uh, differentiable implies continuous. Uh, so long story short is that this theorem applies to our situation. So we're gonna take this and ultimately uh, apply this to our situation. Okay, and how is that gonna happen? Let's build this up from scratch here. So we want to compute an area estimate using n rectangles. So what I first need to do is take our interval of width b minus a and break it into n pieces. Let me call that width, actually. Let me call that width delta x. It's just a small little change in x that, um, well, is gonna be the width of our rectangle, right? This is gonna be the width of each rectangle. So, uh, how far over do you go to get to the first rectangle? You go over b minus a over n. How far do you go over to go to the next rectangle? B minus A over N. You take the total width, you divide by the number of pieces, you get the width of each piece. So each of these pieces is gonna be B minus A over N wide, 
or in general, each of these pieces are going to be just, let's, let's just call it what it is. Let's just say it's a tiny piece of the x-axis thin. So each of these rectangles are a delta x thin. And I tell you what, because I could write out the next point as a plus delta x, and the next point after that as a plus two delta x's, and a plus three delta x's. But let me just call this next point, uh, let me just call it x1, and the point after that x2, and the point after that x3. Uh, because, frankly, uh, whatever that point is, it's just some point along the x-axis, it's a delta x away from our left boundary of uh, A. And then the next point is a delta x away from that, and whatever that point is, let me just call the first partition point x1, and then the next partition point x2. Uh, you're going to go all the way out to x capital N minus 1, uh, because, well, uh, if you think about this, it's going to take N minus 1 partition points, in order to cut the interval into n pieces. If you wanted to cut uh, the interval into two pieces, uh, you need one cut. One cut would give you two pieces. Uh, three cuts would give you four pieces. Uh, four cuts would give you five pieces. So the long story short is n minus one cuts is gonna give you the n pieces that you need. So the, the little points along the x-axis that we're considering, each of them a delta x away, each of them a b minus a divided by n away, that's because we have n rectangles along our region of interest, uh, we've got the points x1, x2, x3 out to x, n minus 1. And now, we want to build up our estimate. So to build up our estimate, we're going to need to pick a point between a and x1. So note, we need to pick a point between a and x1 to base our rectangle. And now, what point are we going to pick? Well, I want to use the mean value theorem to pick that point of interest. So, using the mean value theorem, we're going to pick the point to be such that f of C1, whatever that C1 is, let me call uh, the C1 here. This is just going to be the point of interest that we end up picking. Let me call it C1. C1 because it's on the first subinterval, and it's the C which is going to correspond to the mean value theorem. The function value at C1, which by the way is going to be the height of our rectangle, right? Because when we build our rectangle up here, our first rectangle is going to have a height of f of c1. Well, f of c1, which is the height of our rectangle, is going to be equal to, for the interval of interest, we're looking between a and x minus 1. So that's going to be between f of x1 minus fa over x1 minus a. But uh, think about this for a second. Uh, the, the numerator, I don't know exactly what those values are because we'd have to have the antiderivative function in, in tow to do that. But what is x1 minus a? x1 minus a is the width of the first rectangle. x1 minus a is precisely delta x. So the height of our first rectangle is f of c1. We're choosing the c1 to be the point that's between a and x1, which is guaranteed by the mean value theorem. Uh, this, this height is going to be precisely this value. So what does that mean? It means that the area of our first rectangle is going to be what? Well, like any rectangle, uh, the area is going to be width times height. Well, the width is delta x. That's how wide each of our little rectangles were. And the height is going to be f of c1. But you see, I could write f of c1 in terms of the statement that we have above. And that would give you delta x times f of x1 minus f of a over delta x. But now, even as I say that, f of x times something divided by delta x, those delta x's are going to cancel. And when you cancel those, in other words then, the area of our first rectangle is just f of x1 minus f of a. Okay, so we now have the area of our first rectangle. That's our first piece of data 
in some sense, our first, uh, well, that's our first area information. Now we know the area of this thing. That's, that's going to be of importance to us in terms of finding the area of all n of our rectangles. We've got the area of the first rectangle. Okay, now we need to build a second rectangle. We need to build that rectangle between x1 and x2. So, uh, how about the area of the second rectangle? Now, here's the thing. That second rectangle is also going to have the same width, because all of our rectangles had the same width. We just took our entire interval and chopped into n pieces, because that's how many rectangles we needed. So, the width of that guy is going to be delta x, but what's his height? Now, his height is going to be dependent upon which point we pick to build the height from. I want to pick the point, I'll call it C2. I want to pick the height, or, or the point where I build up my rectangle, I want to pick that point via the mean value theorem. Because if I pick that point via the mean value theorem, this f of C2, if this C2 here is from the mean value theorem, on the interval x1 comma x2 because the interval x1 to x2 is just some closed interval. It's related to some function that is uh, continuous and differentiable because we have an antiderivative function. But the long story short here is I just I look on my interval and I'm going to pick the point where the mean value theorem applies. I'm going to pick the point where f of c2 is going to be equal to what? What do we get here? Here we're using the mean value theorem on x1 comma x2. So the mean value theorem is going to yield capital F of x2 minus capital F of x1 over x2 minus x1. I'm simply applying the mean value theorem to the point that is guaranteed via the mean value theorem. And now, what's downstairs? Downstairs here is x2 minus x1. But x2 minus x1 is just the width of our interval. So the width of our interval is delta x. And that is being multiplied by delta x on the, the, the well, the whole fraction is being multiplied by delta x on the left. So uh, uh, the long story short is delta x times this is delta x times whatever's in the numerator divided by delta x. Uh, as we observe, that x2 minus x1 is just the width of that rectangle. Well, the, the delta x's here are going to cancel, and then the area of our second rectangle is going to be f of x2 minus f of x1, capital F in these cases. But now we can play this same game because we've just started an engine rolling here for the area of our first rectangle and the area of our second rectangle. What about the area of our third rectangle? The third rectangle is also going to be a delta x wide. It's going to be as tall as the function is tall wherever we pick to build up our function. But the thing is, we can pick any point. So let me pick a C3, which is guaranteed by the mean value theorem. There's a C3 guaranteed by the mean value theorem here. Uh, uh, the, the function has an antiderivative, so in particular, that antiderivative function has a derivative, which means it's differentiable, which means the mean value theorem applies. So we look at this C3, and that C3 is going to be by the mean value theorem. So that means what about f of C3? f of C3 is equal to, in this case, the, the C3 is an application of the mean value theorem on the interval from now or between x2 and x3. Well, between x2 and x3, the mean value theorem is going to produce capital F of x3 minus capital F of x2 over x3 minus x2. But denominator, denominator is just the difference between x3 and x2. That's the width of our rectangle. So we have the width of our rectangle times f of x3 minus f of x2 over the width of our rectangle. The width of the rectangle cancels out, and hence the area of the third rectangle is now stated in terms of the antiderivative function at f of x3 and f of x2. But now, let's play this forward here, because if I just take a, like let me just erase the details here because we're starting to see a pattern 
or we can start to see a pattern if we focus on the essential information. Because once we look at these area computations, we see area of, uh, oops, that was the second rectangle. Area of second rectangle is here. Area of third rectangle here. Area of our first rectangle is here. Now, whenever we're computing the estimate for our area under the curve, we're just adding up the areas of all of our rectangles. So the area estimate is just going to be the area of the first rectangle plus the area of the second rectangle plus the area of the third rectangle out to the area of the nth rectangle. Uh, there's n rectangles here, and whenever you add up all of their area, you get precisely your area estimate. Uh, ultimately, out here, you're going to have your nth rectangle. But now, with the pattern that we noticed, we can actually start to cook up the formulas for the areas of these rectangles, exploiting the mean value theorem every interval along. The first rectangle had an area of capital F of x1, minus capital F of n. The second rectangle, an area of capital F of x2 minus capital F of x1. The third rectangle had an area of capital F of x3 minus capital F of x2. Now, what about that last rectangle? Because uh, we've got the first three rectangles. What's that last one going to be? Well, you can actually look at the expressions for these guys, and what ultimately results is that the area of the first rectangle is just capital F of the, the, the right boundary minus capital F of the left. What about the second rectangle? The second rectangle had an area based on our choice from the mean value theorem for our C2 to be capital F of X2 minus capital F of X1. The, the difference in the antiderivative function values at the two endpoints of the subinterval of interest. The subinterval of interest next is between X2 and X3, and the area of the rectangle was the capital F function evaluated at the right endpoint minus the capital F function evaluated at the left endpoint. And what about whenever we get down to the nth rectangle then? So the area of the nth rectangle is going to be capital F of B minus capital F of X n plus one, or excuse me, X n minus one. Because X n minus one is the left endpoint of the last subinterval. But now, check it out. Since we've written out the areas of our n rectangles, I claim there's a lot of overlap here in terms of, well, literally, the terms of this expression. Because you see, there's an f of x1 here, but there's a minus f of x1 on the area expression for the next subinterval. And there's an f of x2 here, but there's going to be a minus f of x2 for the area computation along the next subinterval. And while there's an f of x3 here, when we run the area for the computation of the fourth rectangle, we're going to have a minus f of x3, and that's going to cancel away. And then what about down below? We have this f of x n minus 1. Well, that would have also showed up, and that's a negative here, but it would have showed up positively whenever we would have looked at the area of the previous rectangle, which would have been a difference between the capital F values at f of x n minus 1 and f of x n minus 2. So the f of x n minus 1 is being subtracted here, was being added in for the area of the last guy, and that's going to cancel. And ultimately, the only things that don't cancel whenever we choose our function heights, exploiting the mean value theorem, are f of b, there's nothing to cancel it because it only shows up in one of the rectangles, minus the f of a. There's nothing to cancel it because it only shows up in one of the rectangles. So the long story short is, if instead of picking points on each subinterval at like the left end point or the right end point, if we, pick, if we pick the point sensitively using the mean value theorem, exploiting the fact that if our function has an antiderivative, then that antiderivative function is differentiable, hence continuous, and the mean value theorem applies, well, then our area estimate turns out to be this, and it boils down to two numbers, 
even though we had n rectangles. The numbers that popped out of our computation canceled a lot. But here's the thing to think about. These values, f of b and f of a, don't depend on how many subintervals we chose. If we chose the number of subintervals to be 100, we'd have 100 terms, or 99 terms, I guess, that would cancel along the way. But the f of b and the f of a would still remain. They wouldn't cancel because they're only a part of one of the intervals as we're marching our way along. And so at the end of the day, whether we have n being 100 or n being 1,000 or n going to infinity, the same idea would apply. What if you chopped into a million pieces? You'd have a million little partitions along the way. On each one, pick the C that's corresponding to the mean value theorem, and your sum would look like this. So the long story short is, as n goes to infinity, this expression is unchanged. And so, the area under the curve, when you let the number of rectangles go to infinity, the area under the curve, when there is no error, this is f of b minus f of a, where f is the capital F integral antiderivative function. And the long story short is here, now, when we want to compute the area using n rectangles, letting, when we want to compute the area without error, we can simply do it, capital F of b minus capital F of a, which is almost crazy when you think about it. Because as the number of rectangles goes to infinity, the number, of the number of rectangles that we have goes to infinity. That seems like a lot of numbers to add up. But because of the mean value theorem and the cancellation that popped out as a result of it, even the sum of the areas of infinitely many rectangles would depend only on these two values. And the long story short then is if you want to know the area under the curve, you just need to know this which is kind of amazing. Because what if you want to know the exact area under a parabola on the interval 1, 3? Think about this for a second. You've got a parabola. You're looking between 1 and 3. This is a completely blobbish region that shows up nowhere in a geometry formula textbook anywhere. But if you know that your original function is f of x equals x squared, and you want to find the area on the interval from 1 to 3, you need to do nothing more than take the antiderivative function, plug in 3, plug in 1, and subtract. Uh, note, the C's canceled. And what's left? 27 over 3 minus 1 third. 26 thirds. That is exactly the area under the parabola with zero error. You exploit the mean value theorem for every rectangle along the way, and what ends up happening is that your area computation boils down to an expression that relates only to the left endpoint and the right endpoint. The right hand point and the left, it only depends on the two endpoints. And it depends on having your antiderivative function. The fact that f had an antiderivative function was essential all the way along. But once you have a function, like hell, x squared that has an antiderivative function, you can compute the area under its curve anywhere between any two bounds. And it only boils down to two numbers. When even whenever you were just estimating with six rectangles, it took six heights and six widths, and eight rectangles, eight heights and eight widths. And this is saying infinitely many rectangles, two numbers. It's crazy, but it works. And we
we saw why. We just talked through all the details.